Okay, and then the second speaker is uh, Lorna Dugan, who's going to talk to us about uh, biomaterials. I think. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here in Cambridge, and uh, I'm hoping to share some of the story, um, uh, uh, some of our story towards engineering living hydrogels. Um, so just to set the scene for this, I, I want us to think about the hierarchical assemblies that we find in nature, and they're of course ubiquitous in living systems. And a really beautiful example is the extracellular matrix, and, and you can see this cartoon depiction of this beautiful and, and, and complex matrix in this slide. So in the ECM, you have this hierarchical structure, you have these long fibrous proteins, and you also have a second lens scale. You have this nanoporous hydrogel-like uh, matrix. And what's really important is that this matrix is dynamic, and it's functional, and it responds to mechanical and to biochemical cues. So let's look at the, the details of that. Um, so for example, some of the components include collagen, which is this beautiful hierarchical structure that self-assembles across lens scales and provides very specific mechanical properties because of that hierarchy. We have other components like fibronectin and lamins, which also have a hierarchical structure, but in addition to that, they provide these cell binding receptors and that's really important to have this cohesive network, this dialogue between the cells and the matrix that it finds itself within. <clears throat> and of course, we've got regularization. We've got uh, signaling molecules that can trigger uh, cell uh, differentiation and their fate. And this can happen in a concentration-dependent manner. So this is a really dynamics and, and, uh, dynamic and changing environment. The mechanics is important, and the stiffness of these living tissues can range from the kilopascals to even gigapascals range in certain scenarios. And so we're interested in those mechanical properties and how they connect to the components in these systems. And of course, the mechanical properties are so intriguing, particularly their viscoelastic properties. And this allows these systems, these, these biomolecular networks, to remodel in response to cues that they feel in their environment. So, for example, you can have properties such as strain stiffening, where things get stiffer in response to increased strain. And that can be really vital in certain biological contexts. And then the structure. Uh, so the fiber diameters and the pore sizes provide this architecture within which these biological processes need to take place. So that's an example of a, a real living system that offers a lot of really attractive properties. And one of the interests in my group is understanding how can we capture some of those properties within a bottom-up or a synthetic-based approach. How can we understand them? How can we build them into living materials? And so in this little cartoon that you can see here, we've got lots of building blocks. Again, this is a dynamic process. And some of those building blocks, you might want to promote growth. You might want to trigger a chemical reaction. You might want to be very, very specifically responsive to a mechanical cue. So that's what we're doing. That's what we're trying to do. Um, and we're trying to do this from the context of folded globular proteins. And this is a really interesting cross lens scale problem. Going from our building blocks, which are these folded globular proteins, which have uh, an inherent uh, structure, which have uh, an inbuilt biological functionality, which is specific to that protein and diverse in terms of the proteins that we can choose. We know so much now about the mechanical properties of these single proteins, and that's thanks to the single molecule community and techniques such as the atomic force microscope and optical tweezers, which I'm looking forward to hearing about from Kasia later this afternoon. <clears throat> so these building blocks are mechanically robust, and also they're tunable. So we can do manipulation of the protein. We can do site-specific um, exchanges of amino acids to tune that mechanical response. And we can also use protein engineering to dial in more modular design to these systems. So in this little cartoon here, you can see a polyprotein. There we go. 
So you can engineer this polyprotein to be a specific protein type, to be connected by a certain linker length, and you can even engineer the way in which this protein will connect with other proteins in the system through chemical cross-linking. So we're going to take these building blocks, we're going to allow them to form a chemically cross-linked network, and we're interested in the material properties of that network that forms. And part of our motivation is purely fundamentally to understand uh, how this cross-length scale mechanics and structure takes place, but also in future we want to think about how these materials might be useful in applications. <laughs> and the properties that we're particularly interested in are the fact that we've got this programmable structure and mechanics, if we can understand it, We've got these dynamic properties of a protein and the way it unfolds in response to cues. We have this inbuilt diverse biological functionality and we can make it responsive to external cues that we can control or within a certain setting they might naturally occur. I might just really try. <laughs> Let me get some water. And at the heart of this, there's, there's at least, oh yes, okay. So we, all we need to do is to understand uh, the multi-scale design rules of this system. So we want to understand how the mechanics translates across the lens scales. And we've already heard the word uh, revolution, I think, in the introduction this morning. Or a second industrial revolution, actually, was the phrase that I heard. And I think this is a really exciting time, because as we learn more about these biological molecules, we can really start to exploit them, exploit their assembly and their function. So really, I've put future biomaterials, but we have no idea what we're going to be using this for. I'm not going to talk too much about applications today, but we're very interested in this and working on a number of things. And I'm very happy, particularly, to talk to any of the industry people in the audience. So at the heart of this, there's two really interesting scientific questions for us. So imagine you have a folded protein, this well-defined structure, and instead of being in isolation, it's now connected in this network. How will it respond to the forces that it experiences when it's connected in that network? And how does this structure form in the first place? And so those are the questions. How do the nanoscale molecules connect to form a network? We need to understand that. And how does this mechanics translate across lens scales? Does it matter that a protein has mechanical robustness when it finds itself in a network like this? That's one of the things we're interested in. And so I'm going to try to give uh, two examples, like our, our previous speaker, if, if I can stick to time. And in the first one, I want to share with you what we've understood by exploiting protein unfolding in terms of the way that the network builds and the properties of that network. <coughs> and if I've got time, I'll, I'll move towards a biological setting in the second example. Okay, so how do we do this? How do we form these networks? So in the image on the top right, you can see we take a folded protein. This example is just a, a simple BSA, a helical rich protein, in solution. And we then trigger a chemical reaction, we add chemical reagents, we switch on a blue LED light source, and that allows dityrosines to form. These tyrosines are found, naturally found on the surface of the folded structure of this protein. So that triggers that photoactivated, irreversible chemical cross-linking reaction. So if you look through to the right, we have a nucleation event. These proteins come together. And in time, enough of these connections take place that you have a percolating network or a hydrogel. A hydrogel is a polymeric network in a water-rich environment. And at this point, the viscoelastic properties of your material change quite dramatically. So one of the ways that we study this is with rheology, which gives you a measure of the mechanics of a hydrogel so, for example, we can do oscillatory rheology. And here in this cartoon, you can see the top part of the rheometer. We put our pre-gel solution in here. We have a simple blue LED light source that we can switch on with a particular intensity to trigger the chemical reaction. So we have a nice T equals zero for our experiment. <clears throat> and so, for example, what we can do is measure the storage modulus. This gives us a measure of the stiffness of the material on the rheometer. <clears throat> so at T equals zero, we have a pre-gel solution, a liquid 
There's no measurable stiffness. We switch on our light for a period of time. The, the proteins start to cross-link. We have gelation, and then we can switch off the lamp and monitor the relaxation of the network. And there are two features that we're really interested in. How these networks form, so the network formation, and how these networks relax with time. What are the dynamic properties of this network, and how does the mechanics of the system change with time? The other thing that we're interested in is what these structures look like. And for that, we rely on a scattering, small angle scattering, both with X-rays and neutrons at the ISIS facility and the diamond light source. So this gives you a, a bit of a snapshot of what we see. So these proteins um, here, a protein, a folded protein is represented by a simple circle now. And we are allowing the chemical cross-linking to, to take place. And what we find is that there is a heterogeneous network where we have these clusters, these fractal-like clusters of protein, and then we have those more sparsely populated regions which are connecting the clusters. So we have these clusters of protein and these intercluster regions. And what's quite interesting is if we uh, promote unfolding of the protein, and one way that we can do that is also to rely on DDT. We, we heard about DDT and its use in the first talk. Some of the proteins have a disulfide bonds within their structure. If we add a reducing agent like DDT, we can promote their breaking and make the protein more force labile. And indeed, single molecule experiments have shown that that's the case when you do this, for example, on AFM. So if we do this, as we're forming our cross-linked network, we form a very different structure. So in the case where protein unfolding is allowed or, or, or promoted, we still get this heterogeneous network. We still get these clusters of, of proteins forming. But now the intercluster region is really quite distinct from the case where the protein rem remains mechanically robust. So that's really interesting to us because by tuning the mechanics at the single molecule level, we can tune the mesoscale structure of the networks that we're forming. And of course, the space in the network is often the thing that's quite important for applications. So we've got that tunability parameter based on mechanical properties of a protein. And you can start to have a lot of fun with this. So I mentioned that this is a photoactivated chemical reaction. So that's really nice, and we can start to manipulate that. So imagine again, you've got your protein, we've got a nucleation event. If we simply have the lamp at a high intensity, then we can have a fast reaction rate. And now our process is simply limited by the diffusion of these molecules until they find themselves. We can do a similar experiment where we reduce the reaction rate. We just uh, switch, dial down the intensity of the lamp. And now the system is reaction limited. So this is an external user triggered way of bringing the same building block together and forming very different structures. So we can look at the structural and mechanical properties of these networks and create very different materials based on the way we're assembling the folded proteins in this system. The other thing that we can start to play with is the mechanical robustness of the protein. So if we have something which is mechanically strong and unlikely to unfold, then we will have a network that assembles a little bit like a, a sort of a colloidal-based <coughs> system where we have patchy colloids going through an aggregation process. If we allow more of that unfolding to occur, then we have these biopolymers which are elongated in the solution. And in some cases, we can do that so it's favorable for them to entangle. And now polymer entanglement is the thing that can dominate our system. So I think it's really interesting. Uh, the, the, thinking about the theory of these systems is quite interesting and challenging because it sort of straddles the, the colloid-based literature and the polymer physics-based literature, which is, of course, extremely rich, but we need to think about how our system can learn from each of those fields, and that's something we're enjoying. So these highly entangled hydrogels are extremely interesting from a materials perspective because for, for other polymer-based systems, they've shown that they're excellent load-bearing materials. So this entanglement, this topological entanglement of the polymer is extremely important. 
<coughs> and indeed, very recently, um, some work by the group of Hong Bing Li in uh, British Columbia have shown that you can use this folded protein-based approach. If you trigger unfolding, favor entanglement, you can have a system that goes from being very soft, kilopascals in terms of its stiffness, to gigapascals and be more like a material that might be useful for mimicking cartilage. And this is simply through manipulating the unfolding of the protein. We can take a lot of inspiration from nature. And, and one classic example is Titan, which is this model for spring. And it's responsible for the passive mechanics of muscle. And it's structurally adaptive to force in a very, in a very hierarchical way. And the single molecule community have shown now for many years, both experimentally and with modeling, that the elasticity arises from protein unfolding, in this case from an I27 beta rich folded domain. And these unfolding forces are precise and they're directional, and you can get refolding if you remove that force. So we were interested to see what happens when we take a poly protein of the I27 and we form a gel. And what about the mechanical properties of the gel that we form? So very briefly, if we do this under low strain, and we use a technique called oscillatory frequency uh, rheology, we can measure the G prime in red, the stiffness as a function of frequency, and we see this very slight power law dependence, which is indicative of this fractal structure at the mesoscale, which supports the structural studies that we've done. So basically, that means that at low strain, the viscoelastic properties of this material is governed by the mesoscale structure of the network that forms. But something quite interesting happens when we go to higher strain. We start to see features of non-linear viscoelastic properties. And now at high strain, it's the unfolding of the protein that starts to become important. So it's an interesting interplay between something happening at the nanoscale through to the mesoscale structure of this system. Okay, so my second example. Oh my goodness, how much time do I have? Four minutes. I can do it. Okay. Okay, so now in this second example, I want to think about how we can use protein engineering to address an interesting biological problem. What can we learn about biopolymer networks in vivo? And I'd like you to picture the scene. Monday, on the way home from school, my daughter falls over. A lot of blood, okay? Less than 24 hours later, her knee looks like this. And that's because of, of blood clotting. A scab has formed very effectively. All is well. And so the structure and the mechanics of blood clots is, is really fascinating. So in the image that you can see on the left-hand side, you can see red blood cells and platelets. Blood clots are a really interesting, naturally occurring, self-assembled, active material. And it's composed of these platelets, which are contracting and pulling on this polymer, this biopolymer network, which is the fibrin mesh that you can see in blue. And well, when all is well, this biopolymer network forms and provides mechanics, enough mechanics to stop blood flow continuing to pull apart. Okay. When it goes wrong, the fibrin mesh goes into overdrive. It becomes too stiff, okay? And that becomes a problem and is associated with some disorders. So there's a lot of work out there looking at the properties, the hierarchical networks of these fibrins, which again go from these monomers to these staggered architectures to these fibrous-like networks. And there's lots of examples of these fibrous networks in biopolymer networks. And there's been some seminal work that has shown that unlike polymer gels, these biopolymer, biopolymer gels stiffen as they strain. And this stiffening behavior is thought to be protective. Okay. So rather than having this massive de deformation that would damage a tissue, they, they stiffen against it. So what's going on? And does it matter that it's a fiber? Because remember, I'm working with globular folded proteins. It looks really different from this. So the question that we wanted to ask was, if we take our globular protein and we use protein engineering to engineer a longer aspect ratio, a bit like a fiber, what happens to the networks that form? And we've picked a, a protein that we work with, which is protein L, and we use protein engineering to um, make a number of constructs with increasing aspect ratio, all the way from one 
to up to seven in a row. We've made the linkers between them very short and stiff, so we have these rod-like objects which are increasing in length. And we just want to use this to ask the question, does aspect ratio matter when you form a biopolymer network? Does it matter that all of these biological systems are fiber-based in their network assembly? And so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have to skip over the details, but uh, we did some rheology experiments to measure the storage modulus with time. We measured the lag time, which is defined as the time it takes for gelation to occur. We did this for all of our different constructs and measured the lag time as a function of volume fraction or concentration of our building block in the system. And if you think about that lag time, it's related to how that object is moving around as it tries to form these connections. And there are two components that you can hear, the translational diffusion and the rotational diffusion. Okay? You can think of the crossover between those and you can think of what that would be if you simply modeled this as a simple rod. And just in a little bit more detail, the translational diffusion describes moving the center of mass from here over to the far side. The rotational diffusion, all you need to do is wobble or rotate that center of mass. You don't need to go anywhere. You just need to, to do this. And so what's really interesting is when we did the same thing for a, a biological system, in this case, fibrin. So fibrinogen is this, this large, um, abundant glycoprotein, which is important in blood clotting. And these fibrin networks are, are, are really crucial. And so the fibrin, the fibrin monomers polymerize into protofibrils, and that's what forms the network. So if we take some fibrin, we form a, a network, we measure the lag time, and we look at that as a function of concentration, we see this similar crossover from being translationally limited to rotationally limited in the way that the network forms. So we've got a really interesting synthetic system where we're engineering length or aspect ratio into our system. We're comparing it to a biological system that has inherent high aspect ratio. And we're seeing that these geometric effects, the rotational diffusion, of that object is important in the way the network forms. And we've looked at this in a lot of detail with some of the structural techniques that we use. And we think it's important, the architecture that forms based on the aspect ratio. And it's an advantage to have a high aspect ratio because you get increased mechanical strength. You get more rapid assembly. So imagine that blood clot. It can form much quicker if you're forming it with a fiber than if you're forming it with little stumpy rods. Okay? And that could be really important in a biological setting. My time's definitely up. Uh, so I'd like to acknowledge my group, who are a, a really wonderful um, team of interdisciplinary science that, that I've got the privilege to work with. I'd like to acknowledge my collaborators at Leeds and further afield. Uh, we're based in physics, and, and we're very uh, fortunate to be part of the Asprey Centre for Structural Molecular Biology, and also the, the Bragg Centre for Materials Research. And it's really fun straddling those two research centres. I'd like to thank the funders, and in particular the ERC. Um, and this is where we're going with this. So this is our little Lego pot of building blocks. We want to understand how they assemble at the Mises scale, and we want to start tapping into the biological functionality of these little Lego building bricks to see what we can do with them. We would love to talk to you about the proteins that you're interested in and the applications that are of interest. Um, so thank you for your time. Okay, do we have any questions for Lona? How uniform these hydrogels are? So if you have anybody of interest, how will it interact with those pose there? Will it have a uniformity over, all over or will we see some differences there? What do you mean by uniformity? Uh, like the pore sizes? Yes. Uh, like or will it have the channels like because if you uh, what I assume is that in order to incorporate your new protein mm -hmm. for the applications you will in incubate those proteins with the hydrogel for yeah. a particular duration of time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But how will you ensure that all the pores have been filled? <laughs> There yeah. is no variations there. Yeah, so I guess that's like a templating-based approach. You make your protein-based hydrogel, and then you add a second protein of interest. 
I'm actually interested in using the protein of interest right from the start, right? So I, I want that to be my scaffold so I can exploit both its properties within the crosslink network and I can exploit it as it, as it does its function. So for example, we've been doing that with ligand binding proteins, which binds specifically to, to a ligand as it senses it as it moves through the hydrogel. So imagine over there, as it comes from this direction, these will respond first. It will, let's say, increase the mechanical properties of that protein as it binds the ligand. Whereas over here, it's still uh, yet to, to see the ligand. So I'm interested in that small molecule diffusion of the ligand as it moves through the network and changes my scaffold. My scaffold will change in response to that. Yeah, yeah, okay. Thank you. So I wondered uh, whether you looked at situations where you, these are homo, homo polymers. Mm -hmm. Have you looked at systems where you have hetero? You can introduce other molecules to tune the uh, physical properties. Yeah, that's a lovely question. And, and of course, there's so much inspiration from the single molecule community where there's rich, rich information about proteins and their different mechanical properties. So for example, you can take a heteropolyprotein where you have a mechanically robust protein and sandwiched in between, you've got something that unravels very easily. And so that's a little bit like the double network hydrogel community, if people are familiar with that. But in that case, you've got one network and another one built on top of it. By using a heteropolyprotein, your building block itself can offer that dual mechanical response. So you can have a bit of a sacrificial lamb within your construct to respond very quickly to force. Uh, but then you still got the integrity of that second component that will remain folded. Yep. Okay, one more, one more question here. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, sorry if you've maybe already mentioned something on this line, but and I don't know how feasible it is, but um, have you ever, sort of, um, you see about you, uh, there's a gelation and then you look at the relaxation. Um, can you then reverse that to then see the process again and again and see how the mechanical properties change, if, if they change? That's, that's a great question. So for the example we showed today, our chemical cross-linking is irreversible, right? So the network forms. But what's really interesting is to see um, the relaxation in the example I showed has two components. One component we think is the network rearranging, and the second component is further unfolding of the protein. You know, imagine you've got this building block and it's strained within this network or whatever configuration it, it has found itself in. And that means some of these proteins will continue to unfold. So I, I didn't show it today, but we've done a lot of biophysical characterization, so CD and FTIR, to monitor that unfolding over 12 hours, 24 hours. So this is a really dynamic system. And, and you could imagine a case where you flood the system to completely change that environment. I gave the ligand example, and that's really going to change how that relaxation responds. Yeah. Okay, I think we'll move on, and thank Lorna once again. Thank you.